Welcome back to Event Explorer, the podcast where we uncover the stories behind the world's most fascinating events. Today, we're diving into the world of beer festivals with a special focus on the iconic Great American Beer Festival in Denver, Colorado. This isn't just a celebration of beer, it's a testament to the vibrant and ever-evolving craft beer industry in the United States. And believe it or not, craft beer wasn't always the staple it is today. The journey of American beer has been one of resilience and innovation. From the dark days of prohibition to the explosion of the craft beer movement in the late 20th century, the legalization of homebrewing in 1979 in particular sparked this revolution, leading to the birth of craft breweries across the country. These pioneers, driven by a passion for quality and creativity, transformed the beer landscape, bringing a diversity of flavors and styles that had never been seen before. As craft beer grew, so did the need for a platform to showcase these innovations. And that's where these beer festivals came into play. Festivals like the GABF have become crucial for brewers and beer lovers alike. They're more than just events. They're cultural phenomena that celebrate creativity, craftsmanship, and establish a community that defines the craft beer industry. Since its inception in 1982, the GABF has grown from a small gathering in Boulder to the largest ticketed beer festival in the U.S. today. It features over 500 breweries and more than 4,000 beers, drawing attendees from all over the country. But GABF is more than just a place to sample beers. It's a key event that shapes trends and influences this billion-dollar industry. Winning a medal at the GABF can be a game-changer for a brewery, catapulting it into the national and international spotlight. Modern beer festivals like the GABF are vital for the craft beer community. They provide a space for brewers to connect with each other and their fans, showcasing their latest creations and gaining recognition. These events also foster a sense of community among enthusiasts, offering them a chance to explore new flavors, discover new breweries, and engage with the industry in a really meaningful way. In today's episode, I'm honored to be sitting down with Ann Obenchain, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Brewers Association, to talk about the importance of the GABF and its impact on the craft beer industry. Anne has been at the forefront of promoting this iconic festival, and she's here to share insights on what makes it such a pivotal event in the world of beer. So let's dive in. All right, today we are thrilled to welcome Anne Obenchain, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the Brewers Association, to talk about one of the most iconic events in the craft beer world, the Great American Beer Festival. With over 40 years of history, the GABF has grown from a small gathering in Boulder to a massive celebration of craft beer in Denver, attracting brewers and beer lovers from all areas and corners of the country. Anne has been at the helm of promoting this incredible festival, and we're excited to dive into the stories and evolution of the GABF with her here today. Welcome, Anne. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. This has really been... Um, an exciting thing for me to be able to talk to you because I've been following the festival, you know, I it's it's almost as old as I am. And from when I first got interested in craft beer, which uh, is right on the day I turned 21, um, I I knew of the craft beer festival, uh, the Great American Beer Festival. Um, can you give us a little bit of background of, of what is it, about 40 years ago? How did this all get started? Of course. Uh, well, the first Great American Beer Festival was held in a small hotel in 1982 back in Boulder. And there were, that was just at the beginning for some of your listeners, you know, in the late 70s, our beloved President Jimmy Carter signed a um, bill that included a, a clause that made home brewing at home legal. And that really enabled home brewers and some of our bigger craft brewers to start experimenting. And that was really the spark of the what I would call the craft beer revolution. So the Sierra Nevadas of the world, the anchor steams of the world started in garages and then became breweries. And so at the you know, at the beginning in nineteen eighty two, this is when people that had been home brewing were starting to have commercial breweries. So 1982, there were 24 breweries serving 47 beers. We had about 800 attendees. Um, the festival started to get a little larger. It moved to Denver in 1984. 
And then again, it moved to a larger hall, which has since been replaced by the Colorado Convention Center. And we've been at the Colorado Convention Center since 2000. Since those 24 breweries nearly 42 years ago, we have grown to nearly 500 breweries this year, thousands of of, uh, beers being served and other beverages being served as well as tens of thousands of um, attendees. So it is the longest standing um, beer festival in the nation and the largest beer festival in the nation. People are coming from all over the country. This isn't just, you know, did it start off as kind of a Coloradan thing or was it national from the start? It was national from the start. You know, we had uh, folks in California, folks on the East Coast and our um, president and founder of the association and of the beer festival, Charlie Papazian, is based here in Boulder, Colorado. So it's like, why Boulder? He's like, well, come to us. You know, we're the hotbed and, and come here. Mm-hmm. But it has been national from the start. Um, this year we have 40, uh, all four, 49 states plus the District of Columbia represented. We have um, attendees from all over the world that come to Denver for the festival. It's it's really a, a wonderful gathering of um, the community of both beer lovers and breweries. This serves a couple different audiences. Um, there are beer fans and there are beer makers, and I'm sure there's you could even eliminate you know to subsects of that or or even more. Um, from a brewer perspective, why do they come to the festival and, and um, what do you what services do you kind of offer for them? Is, is there education along with people being able to sample their wares? Are there um, meetings and, and conference style things where people can get educated and expand their businesses? For the breweries, there's a, a lot of different reasons that they might attend. You know, one is to be part of the community and support the brewing community. Um, Second is to put their brand on a national stage. So sometimes Mm -hmm. they're about to distribute into Colorado. So they might be um, coming and saying, hey, I'm new and here I am and taste my beer. It's also a great way to get instant uh, customer feedback. So they might be experimenting. Often the festival will bring um, special beer that's made just for the festival, so you can't taste it elsewhere. Or you can get, um, you might be thinking about it and be, you, you have thousands of taste buds right there to give you instant feedback. Um, in addition, you know, the awesome. community of brewers, you know, they are a very collaborative um, community, so they like to collaborate with each other on projects. It's a great place for them to learn from each other. And then we do offer um, some networking opportunities for the brewers behind the scenes um, on the on the private side of the festival. Additionally, uh, as part of the festival is also the nation's largest beer competition. So many of these brewers have sent their beers to the Great American Beer Festival competition to be judged, um, we, it's we're at nearly ten thousand entries now, over a hundred styles. It takes multiple days and hundreds of judges to judge these beers, um, but all of those uh, winners are announced on the third day of the festival on Saturday morning. So um, it's another way to be there to celebrate with the community, but also in winning a medal in the festival can put your brewery on the map. So um, it's a great way if you happen to be in the competition, you win and you're pouring at the festival, you are a very popular booth right after the the um, awards are announced. And this is a medal of honor that that people take home and, and um, becomes a draw. I would, you know, as people are researching, I know there's a huge amount of, of beer and brewery tourism now. And as people uh-huh. are researching what brew pub should I visit? The the um, GABF awards are are kind of those um, benchmarks that of of breweries that they know have have really made the effort and and um, have won in such an illustrious competition. Yes, they really um, are. Have you seen? That? And and so this has grown. You know, those winners, even those early winners, you mentioned Anchor Steam in Sierra Nevada. These these early breweries, these have become billion dollar businesses. I mean, you, you, this is this is not in a small hall in Boulder anymore. This is this is major big business. Have uh-huh. you seen um, 
have have they worked with you along these years to expand the event? You know, I'm thinking this has gone from a a, a smaller kind of you know a, almost beer geek event to something that is akin to a CES or or a um, Overland Expo. You know, these big kind of um, thematic events. Have the breweries um, stepped up their game while you've also increased the size? Do you have um, big big footprints for these breweries? Um, and yes, and it depends. You know, each year the breweries come depending on what they're they're looking to, um, what their messages are. They're looking to uh, share with their customers what beers they're using to share with their customers. You know, some are there. Two years ago, it was Sierra Nevada's 40th anniversary. So they brought their original brew house so people could see like their original brew house. Um, others like uh, the Boston Beer Company, um, makers of Sam Adams, will use the um, Great American Beer Festival still as a platform for a special release of an amazing beer right there at the festival. So they're they're there with their brand for you know the masses, but then they're also releasing um, its utopia, and they will you know mm-hmm. pour it starting at you know eight p.m. on every night, and you can see the line of people that really appreciate that. So many of these brands are reaching out to all kinds of beer fans, you know the ones that have been with them since the very beginning, as well as new people looking to discover new beverages. These fans, um, you say 49 states and, and D.C. for the breweries, but I imagine these fans are, are not just um, U.S. citizens. You have people traveling in from all over the world. What's the audience looking like from the from the fan side? We're, we're still selling tickets, so we have tickets available. So all of your listeners have the opportunity to um, go to greatamericanbeerfestival.com and, and purchase tickets to join us this October. Um, But we have, what I've seen so far, continues the trend of ticket ticket buyers and attendees from from all 50 states, as well as around the the globe, from Europe, from the UK, from South America, um, from Asia. It's always exciting to see the the mix of people at the festival. From a uh, schedule standpoint, I know the beer hall opens, they can go sampling, but are there um, special events, music, um, staged um, presentations that that you guys are putting on? I know, I imagine the awards ceremony must kind of be a big draw for attendees as well. What's the schedule look like this year? So this year, um, we are calling, the theme is unlike ever beer for. Um, In the past, we've uh, (laughs) arranged the breweries um, either by alphabetical order or by region. And we were looking back and we saw, you know, gosh, this really hasn't changed much. And so many of our attendees are coming for the experience. They're coming to hang out with their friends, especially our younger, our younger attendees. Um, You know, their tastes are varied. Um, They're maybe not coming for a guided beer session. So what we did this year is we have rearranged um, the floor plan and we have experience areas. So the brewers are picking different experience areas that they will be in. We have a Prost is our beer garden, uh, German beer garden themed area. We have a Fright, which is a Halloween theme. We're going to lean into Halloween because why not? Uh, we have another area, which is a sports-themed area, um, where there will be big TVs and you can watch games, play games, sports sports on television. We have another area called Chill, which is basically a big backyard with music, live music and bands playing the entire time. Um, and then we also have some of our other favorites of things people can do while they're drinking. Um, we have our, our silent disco um, a karaoke stage. Uh, we have costume themes. So there's lots to do, and we hope to have something for everybody. That is a ton to do. You're really putting the festival now in festival. It feels like you know this is yes. this is competitive with 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 music fests all over the country. That that this exactly. can, this is a multi day entertainment event. Very cool. Um, from from your perspective, your job, which is 
getting the word out and and branding, you know, Great American mm-hmm. Beer Festival and, and making sure that it stays relevant and people um, are enticed to come every year. Um, from what I saw, you are decking out Denver with your branding. <laughs> you know, everyone in town needs to know this is going on. I saw I saw um, wrapped vehicles and, and huge signage <laughs> and all this stuff. I think that's awesome. Um, how, when do you start kind of publicizing this year and and how does that scale up as you get towards um, the event? I know I know early ticket sales in, into the event is is um, you know several different drivers along the way. Yeah, we usually um, start talking about the event and selling tickets in May and June uh, prior to each year. And then right about um, early September, uh, we about the last six weeks leading up to the festival is when we really like to turn on the fire hose. And um, if you happen to be in Denver... I mean, we start out with national promotions and then we regionally, we start to change that radius and become smaller. So um, mid-September is about when we stop with some of our international promotions and some of our long, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 mile away promotions and then start focusing on the Denver area. So if you happen to be in Denver in the next four weeks, you're not going to miss... information about the beer festival. Well, that's awesome. What type of um, social or, or kind of digital advertising really seems to, to work to draw um, these broader audiences in? Are you, are you creating content about the festival to get people enticed or at, using content you've generated from the festival? That's a great question. You know, it really depends on the market. So we also work very closely with the Convention and Visitors Bureau called Visit Denver, so we work with them in pitching Denver as a destination out to other cities and other media markets. Um, those are different stories that we tell there. Um, then we also do advertising specifically in hot markets that come to Denver, like Chicago, the Chicago area, Southern California, Texas, some of those larger um, DM markets that come to Denver. We focus on them. Um, telling a story about the festival. Um, We also have, we're always working on reaching our young demographics, so our our legal drinking age Gen Zs. And uh, they are an interesting group that we work, you know, with influencers and working through TikTok, working through Snapchat, working through um, walled garden, advertising that comes into your phone depending on where you are so I can set demographics of you know Daniel's going to be in a brewery in Indiana in August and I'm going to target him and tell him about the beer festival so we do things like that Um, locally here on the ground we are plastering just about every digital screen that you can find in Denver whether it's at in an apartment building, a bar, a gym, um, a music venue, um, giant squares or downtown. So those are some of the ways that that we reach out in addition to you know, the, the traditional social media and print methods. Well, yeah, you've had to, uh, to advance to keep this um, such, a, such a strong place. Um, tell me a little bit about just from your personal perspective and, and you know, at working with the um, National Brewers Association, the place that festivals have in the beer industry and, and the spirits industry, you know, we all know um, about Oktoberfest, which, uh-huh. which seems to coincide a little bit with your timing and, and that uh-huh. historically, um, per, maybe particularly in America too. How, how has that, how has the industry grown and, and what does it contribute to um, to these different businesses? So I think, you know, the festival provides, it's a great question. And, you know, the festival has grown just as the craft beer industry has grown. And, and they both went through a, a really um, fantastic growth period up, leading up until COVID. And then, you know, it's tapered off. We've seen consumers... L- experimenting with other different beverages but at its core you know the festival is a way for us to showcase the beverage of beer 
showcase other beverages that breweries are making and keep um, our breweries and our members as a trade association at the forefront of uh, consumers' minds, of the media minds. And that's really what the what the purpose of the festival is, is, you know, to pr- promote the web promote the beverages and the um, the breweries that are making them and the small businesses that are behind them. Very cool. Very cool. Well, this year sounds pretty outstanding um, with all the different areas. Are, are there any um, particular aspects of the festival that you're looking forward to yourself this year? I Every year, I just love seeing what is new and what people are making. Um, this year, last year, we added cider and non-alcoholic beverages um, to our mix. This year, in addition, we're adding um, hard teas, hard lemonades, and ready-to-drink cocktails because breweries are making all of these beverages as they have customers coming in looking for them. So we'll have... Uh, an amazing variety of different things for people to sample. Uh, I'm also curious on the entertainment side, one of our um, brewery partners, Denver Beer Co., is bringing uh, Lucha Libre Mexican wrestlers to the festival. So (laughs) Thursday and Friday night, we will have three or four matches each night of uh, Lucha Libre wrestling. So you can have some additional new entertainment at the festival, which we have never had before. So it's quite the, um, Oh, how cool. Said, the variety show of entertainment. Super diverse. Okay. So this is this, I mean, and now I'm picturing you building a wrestling ring and, and creating the area for them to do this. What's the team like now, um, you know, from from these early guys setting up, you know, folding tables in, in a hotel ballroom to, you know, this this massive undertaking? Um, what kind of areas are, are we? We've got the operations and communications and um, security, you know, what's the size of the team and, and um, how many of those people kind of ramp up just for the year? Well, we couldn't do it without our volunteers. I mean, we have 3000 volunteers that help us every year. And we have an amazing volunteer coordinator who works with our volunteer captains. And that is a whole village of, of people that we are forever grateful to. Um, we also work with um, the convention center and the exposition hall staff and contractors, uh, security team, um, Denver PD, all of these people come together. But the first thing when we hit the ground is We have probably 12 semi-trailers of beer. Let's go back to the beverage first. Um, Beer and ice. So we're bringing in... Let me just look here. I mean, we're bringing in an estimated 125 tons of ice. So two of those refrigerated semis are just ice. Um, we have more than three miles of draft line that we need to line. So we have a, a beer service team that will set the floor and set the draft lines. And then we bring in the, you know, then they set the tables, they set the backdrops. People come, some breweries that have booths will be setting up their booths, uh, usually Thursday afternoon. Then we bring in the beer and connect all the draft lines. And then we, what we call ice the floor. So a lot of our volunteers and our our contract staff will then ice down all the kegs. But keeping all of that um, cold throughout the festival is, is, you know, one of the volunteers' jobs is pulling beer to all of those, all of those booths. So, I mean, we're usually talking about 4,000 kegs, 2,500 cases of beer, it's a lot of volume of just product that the team is is organizing as well. Wow. Um, and, and there's a, you know, this is a controlled um, beverage. So, so that it? all kind of gets looked after too, right? This is, you have to keep things secure, yes. make sure, you know, it's, I'm right. sure it's, uh, you know, everyone's 21 and up that's in there makes it probably a little bit easier. Is, are there any kid focused things or this is all adult no, all the time? this is a 21 
plus event only. And yeah. yeah, so we've, you know, some of the, you know, when we talk about logistics for the event, you know, one of the things the event team first has to do is, you know, to work with the state liquor board and, and our distributors to ensure that we have the correct permits for the event. So that is um, no small feat. And then, you know, we work with the breweries. We set up more than, there's nearly 30 distribution sites um, where breweries are delivering their beer to us. So you don't have to ship your beer from Indiana or Michigan to Denver. You're going to send it to a a place near you. And then we're going to take possession of it and get it to Denver. So there's no cost there. But so there's a huge matrix of logistics that we work through to make it easy for the brewer. Um, So all they have to do is show up pour their beer. We're going to take care of their beer, make sure it's cold, make sure it's going to pour correctly. And um, so they can just talk to the customers. And that empowers the brewers too, right? They don't ha- they don't have a distribution network to get things over to you. So that's that's really cool. So they only need to travel that that first hundred miles or so, or, or maybe even less, Correct. probably in a lot of cities, um, to to get you the product, and you'll bring it to Denver. And when it yep. shows up, it's it's going to be the the right temp and and ready to drink and and ready to talk exactly. about. Yeah, before before we wrap up, I just was wondering, you know, any kind of highlight moments or uh, Sierra Nevada bringing their original brew pub to Denver from Chico, Colorado is very or uh, California is very cool. Any other kind of standout moments that have really said like, wow, we we this is bigger than I thought it would ever be kind of moments. I think just to see we've got 122 first time breweries coming to pour at the festival this year and just to see that there is still that interest and breweries are still coming to Denver, still seeing the festival as valuable, still in, still wanting to be part of it, um, just warms my heart and is super exciting. So I can't wait to see what they'll be pouring. And, and it's just fun to see everybody smiling. I mean, everybody's so happy at these festivals. You know, the breweries, the attendees, uh, it's, a, it's a great meeting of the brewing community. I love that. Yeah, so, some really um, special moments in, in these bonds that are forged. I imagine um, you've probably, you know, the, the festival has seen a first-time brewer come in, and, and five years later they're, you know, distributing to multiple states and, and uh-huh. have multiple bars and are, and are really, you know, enriching their own hometown and across the country. So, I mean, it's, it's a, a heck of a service that you're providing. It also sounds like a very good time. So, um Congratulations on on the new kind of um, approach this year too. I think that just sounds really cool, and it's, and it's something different. Yeah. So, so um, you know, kudos to the to the creativity and all the great work you do for communities all across the country and in the beer industry. So, I'm looking Thank forward you. to to hearing more about it as the festival goes on. Say, uh, you know, we're um, say someone's not ready to make the jump yet, but they want to they want to see it so that they they can come and, and get enticed. Um, what kind of handles should people be following and and be able to get the stories out of the festival? Um, on Instagram and Facebook, you know, Great American Beer Festival is and G A B F are our our social handles, so you can watch for videos and and photos from the floor. Well, Anne, thank you again for joining us, and uh, I think people will get a lot of this out of this episode and and definitely be a little bit thirsty by the end. So I hope um, so. Thank Thanks, you so Danielle. much. And that wraps up today's episode of Event Explorer. We hope you enjoyed learning about the significance of beer festivals like the GABF. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends. Until next time, cheers and happy exploring.